Welcome back everybody. Today we're going to be talking about German and Italian unification. Let's begin. Both unification movements in Germany and Italy have similar characteristics. Both countries were geographical expressions long before they were nations. Both countries shared a common obstacle, and that was Austria. Since the Congress of Vienna, Austria dominated Central European politics and including control of Northern Italy. By the mid-19th century, unifying Germany and Italy appeared to be almost hopeless, but both countries would achieve unification at the same time. Both Germany and Italy would achieve national unity through the pressure of a dynamic state. In Italy, it was Sardinia, and in Germany, it was Prussia. Final, the final victory for each country would be achieved through the efforts of a master politician and statesman, from Cavour in Italy to Bismarck in Germany. Both men would find the basis for unity in force. We're going to divide this lecture into two parts. First, we'll handle the unification of Germany, and then in the second part of the lecture, we'll discuss Italy. Just kidding, let's change this. Geographically, German has really no natural frontiers uh, on the eastern and western boundaries. In the past, it was either by the push of foreigners into German lands or more often pressing outward of, of Germany, especially to the east, uh, that caused their boundaries to grow. Because Germany didn't form into a nation until later, uh, they didn't expand overseas like France or Great Britain, but instead Germans expanded eastward toward Poland and Russia. What this did was it formed islands of the German language, culture, and loyalty uh, inside other European kingdoms. This would create a great problem in the future. Germany also had no single focal point, not like uh, London to England or Rome to Italy or Paris to France. Uh, Berlin was not really the heart of Germany. There were other relatively modern cities like Munich, Dresden, and Cologne um, that had city histories pointing back centuries. Germany, more often than not, or Germans saw themselves really connected to their region. The Rhine is not a focal point either. During barbarian times, this was the dividing line between the Roman world and the Germanic world. Only recently, in the 18th and 19th century, did this become romanticized. Germany was far from homogeneous. Goths, Vandals, Franks, the Alemanni, Burgundians, Frisians, Saxons, and some Slavs all mingled to form the population of modern Germany and all had different cultures and histories. So this idea of cleavage permeated German thinking. So this is very common of European um, ethnic or tribal divisions. As we can see here in this map, the green area represents the areas where German is the predominant language. It doesn't na naturally conform to na uh, national borders. So both Christianity and paganism run steadily through German history. It had been said that Germany was never entirely or thoroughly Christianized, and the eastern parts of Germany they were overwhelmed by Charlemagne, who conquered the Saxons under Wittekind. Germany, Germany only accepted Christianity under duress. Charlemagne offered them a choice, Christianity or annihilation. 
later in the Protestant Reformation, pagan traditions were starting to resurface. And during the Romantic period, an artistic movement known as Strom und Drang brought music uh, of Richard Wagner and the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. But Germany remained equally divided amongst Protestants and Catholics. Perhaps the most notable feature was Germans politi uh, Germany's political disunity. Unlike other countries in Western Europe, royal power in Germany never fully achieved a central position. Like in France, monarchical power was consolidated against the feudal lords. In the Holy Roman Empire, there were many people who paid homage or dreamed of a universal empire, but the attention was focused on Italy, not Germany. The other problem with this was energies were generally expended in endless struggles between the Holy Roman Empire and the might of the papacy. And in this struggle, Holy Roman emperors were forced to call on their feudal barons to aid them and make concessions to them. Thus, numerous principalities arose. Whereas other countries saw the breakup of feudalism and the emergence of a tightly knit national state, in Germany, feudalism lingered for centuries. But the idea of a universal empire was an ever-present idea in many political circles. What Germany really lacked was an emergence of a strong capitalist class. The economic transformations brought about by the Age of Discovery and the subsequent commercial revolution did not occur in Germany because Germany didn't participate in colonization. Until well into the 19th century, much of northern Germany was predominantly agricultural and still feudal. So to the things we've mentioned, add another layer. The beginnings of Prussia as a great power coincided with a rise in, in German nationalism. Germany's national movement was really confronted with a rivalry between Prussia and the Habsburgs. The Habsburgs were seen as guardians of the universal tradition of the old empires, and they were rulers of non-Germans as well. What set Prussia apart was they had a series of competent rulers who built up a state bureaucracy and military as a way to achieve a strong and aggressive state. Frederick the Great was the third king of Prussia. And he ranks amongst one of the most dominant figures in the history of modern Germany. It's under his leadership that Prussia became one of the greater states of Europe. He increased its territories and military strength to striking effect. From early in his reign, Frederick achieved a high reputation as a military commander, and the Prussian army rapidly became a model admired and imitated in many other states. He also emerged quickly as a leading exponent of the ideas of an enlightened government. Perhaps the most important foreign policy development in Frederick's reign was the partitioning of the first partition of Poland in 1772. By this, Prussia gained the Polish province of West Prussia, though without the great commercial city of Danzig. And thus, Brandenburg and Pomerania, the core of the monarchy, became linked and with theretofore isolated East Prussia. This gave the state much greater territorial coherence and a more defensible frontier. It also moved its geographical center decisively east and sharpened the social and political differences that tended to separate it from the, west, the rest of Western Europe. Frederick's main objective was to increase the power of the state. His desire to foster education and cultural life was sincere, but not with humanitarian goals. The real benefit would be to increase the size of his army and gain the financial resources needed to maintain it. The army was the, pivotal, the pivot around which all else turned, and the administrative system 
existed essentially to recruit, feed, equip, and pay for it. In proportion to the resources available to support it, its size was unparalleled anywhere in Europe. In 1740, for example, Frederick in inherited a standing army of 83,000 men. When he died, he had turned it into an army of nearly 200,000. Under him, it remained a force of peasants and of numerous foreign recruits, obtained often by outright kidnapping. The Prussian military was almost wholly recruited from the countryside. The real function of townsmen was to pay for it through their taxes and not to serve in it. Up to a point, Frederick tried to protect the peasants and the soldiers against the demands of the Junker class. Prussia's successes impressed upon the rest of Germany a set of core values and traditions. And these ideas became accepted universally in Germany. That was one, the unique position of the army as the head mechanism of state, the creation of an officer corps, and the supremacy of the military over, over civil service. During the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the Holy Roman Empire was dominated by the French. Napoleon even created a series of puppet states throughout Germany. So the Napoleonic Wars brought a wave of nationalist reaction, and this was heightened by the shame of Germany's inability to drive out the French. Some of the German states, including Austria, had temporarily even aligned themselves with Napoleon. However, Prussia remained firmly opposed to Napoleon and had shared the glory of his, of his defeat at Waterloo. So in the so place, in the place of, a nation, of a nation, there existed, there existed 39, 39 German, German states, states including, including Austria, Austria and, Prussia. and Prussia. And only, and only Austria, Austria and Prussia, and Prussia were, strong were strong enough, enough to, lead to lead any unification, unification movement. movement. So the, so question, the question really, really would, be, would be, why not, why not Austria? Austria? I mean, if you really think about it, Austria, rather than tiny Prussia, should have been unifying all of Germany. But by this time... Austria could not risk any further expansion. See, the Austrian Empire had moved east, and with its diverse nationalities, um, who were mostly opposed to any kind of German unification. Perhaps if Prussia had a master politician, they could accomplish unification. Count Prince Otto von Bismarck became that politician. As we look at famous Germans in history, Charlemagne, Luther, Hitler, Bismarck should be on that list as well. Born Karl Schurz uh, and educated in Western Prussia, he was part of the Junker class of landed aristocrats. The von in his name signifies this. After a session at university, uh, he was described as an indifferent student, but a capable duelist and rake. He entered government service, and this was the only career open for the Junker class besides the military, which he only served a very short involuntary stint. Dismissed after a short time for irregular and dissipated habits, and for centuries the Junkers had furnished the, Pers uh, the Prussian state with the bulks of its bureaucrats and high army officials. He was one of a group of aristocrats who had urged the Prussian king not to accept a crown of shame at the Frankfurt Assembly during the revolutions of 1848. From 1851 to 1862, Bismarck would serve in a series of ambassadorships at the German Confederation in Frankfurt, in St. Petersburg, Russia, and in Paris. This experience gave him the insight into the vulnerabilities of Europe's great powers. When William I became Prussia's king in 1861, he appointed Bismarck as his chief minister. Though technically deferring to William, in reality Bismarck was in charge, manipulating the king with his intellect and the occasional tantrum while using royal decrees to circumvent the power of elected officials. Bismarck had said, I am at first and foremost a royalist, 
Everything else comes after that. He was also quoted to say, Prussia is not like England, where the ministry is responsible to Parliament. We are ministers of His Majesty, the King. Bismarck, at heart, was a brilliant opportunist and manipulator. He was the supreme Machiavellian ruler. He became adept at blending the right proportion of diplomacy and military force to achieve German unification. So he was a master at waging war abroad to downplay unrest on the domestic front. Within eight years of power, he had unified Germany, and Bismarck was the supreme manifestation of Nietzsche's will to power. An inherent desire for power is what dominates him. So let's talk about how Bismarck achieved his unity. Bismarck followed a succession of steps with uncanny clever, cleverness. He plotted to eliminate Austria from her commanding position in the Germanic Confederation. What followed were three separate wars with Denmark, Austria, and France that were used to achieve his goals. As a description, the German-Danish war tested the sharpness of the Prussian sword and the boldness of his strategy. The Austro-Prussian war was the power of the Prussian military measured against an equal partner. The Franco-Prussian war was to show that the Prussian army was now at the peak of its perfection. See, in Bismarck's own words, he said, We fear only God. Nothing else in the world now seems justified. Each of these three wars laid the basis for the next one, and the last one helped pave the way for a wider world in World War I. The first war enabled Bismarck to consolidate his internal position in Prussia and laid the groundwork for, his, for the defeat of his parliamentary opposition. The second war succeeded in ousting Austria from the leadership of Germany and in consolidating Prussian hegemony in the north. Lastly, the Franco-Prussian War succeeded in bringing South German, the South German states under the Aegeus of the Prussian Eagle, and it crushed all pretense for any solution to the problem of German unity under anything other than blood and iron. So a brief description of each uh, graphically illustrates Bismarck's genius at dip diplomacy and power. In, In the, the Danish, Danish War of 1864, uh, Bismarck had entered into a dispute with Denmark over two provinces, Schleswig and Holstein. Those provinces were primarily inhabited by Germans, but the King of Denmark ruled there. And since 1815, Holstein including, uh, was included in the Germanic Confederation, when in 1864 the Danish King attempted to annex them, Bismarck invited Austria to participate in a war against Denmark. This brief struggle ended with the Danish ruler renouncing the claim to the two provinces in honor of Austria and Prussia. Then, a sequel occurred that Bismarck wanted a quarrel between the victors over the division of these spoils. And this pr uh, plunged Austria and Prussia into a war. Known as the Seven Weeks War, Bismarck knew that the Habsburgs would be helped by southern German provinces. So Bismarck fashioned an alliance with Italy, promising to reward her uh, if there was a victory with the Duchy of Venice. That was an Austrian-controlled area. Prussia won the war, and Austria gave up claims to Schleswig and Holstein and Venice as well. Plus, Austria acquiesced in the dissolution of the German Confederation. The following war, Bismarck proceeded to unite all the German states in the north, are north of the main river into a northern German confederation. The constitution of this confederation, as Bismarck had boasted he had wrote in a single night, provided the king of Prussia with a hereditary pres uh, presidency. There would be two houses, the upper house representing the governments of several states, and the lower house would be elected by universal male suffrage. On the preceding slide, you'll see the corresponding map to this. In this map, we can see the conclusion of the Austro-Prussian War and the territorial changes that happen. For a more detailed um, look at this presentation, please refer to your Canvas page. The final step in the completion of Bismarck's unity plan 
was the Franco-Prussian War. So the French policy toward Germany from the days of Cardinal Richelieu uh, in, in the 17th century was a policy of continuous opposition to national unification. Whereas Bismarck had so it said Deutschland über alles, it was the French that preferred the, the phrase, the more Germanys, the better. Bismarck wrote in his reminiscence, and I quote, given the attitude of France, our national sense of honor compelled us to go to war. Bismarck, Bismarck knew war with France was the best possible uh, thing to kindle a German nationalism in Bavaria and Württemberg and the remaining states on the main river in southern Germany. So when, infor when he was informed by King William that by the demand of France for a perpetual exclusion of the Hollandsoan family from the Spanish throne, Bismarck decided the time was right for action. He released an altered telegram to infer that King William had insulted the French ambassador. When the French people learned of it, the whole nation was in an uproar. When Napoleon III's ministers asked for a declaration of war, there were only 10 votes against it. France had long wanted a war with Prussia. And no sooner had the struggle begun than the southern German states rallied to the side of Prussia, believing that Prussia was the victim of aggression. From the beginning, Prussia had the advantage. A disciplined German army against a small and ill-organized uh, French fighting force. Napoleon III himself was captured at the Battle of Sedan in 1870. After his capture, uh, the conquest of Paris laid four months away, and then the war was over. France was forced to surrender significant portions of Alsace-Lorraine and agreed to pay an indemnity of $1 billion. So a patriotic enthusiasm generated by the wars made it possible for Bismarck to absorb the German states into the Northern German Confederation. Treaties were negotiated during the course of the war stipulating all of Germany be united into a Hollandsoan empire. The agreements were formalized at an impressive ceremony at Versailles in 1871. This had been Louis XIV's palace. King William of Prussia became German emperor. Bismarck himself was now raised to the dignity of a prince and became the imperial chancellor, uh, which equates to a prime minister, that making him only answerable to the emperor or kaiser. Bismarck would rule for the next 20 years, and the Norman Ger German Confederation's constitution would be accepted as the constitution of the new empire. I thought I, I would thought share, I would the share the funny cartoon, cartoon, cartoon with you. This is Napoleon, Napoleon III, III um, submitting, submitting uh, uh, the people, the people of, France. of France. Thought that was thought funny. That was funny. This is, um, um, you could judge, you could judge for, yourself for yourself there. So with so Bismarck's, with Bismarck's cleverness, cleverness, he achieved, he achieved what centuries, centuries of, fighting of fighting could not, could do, not do, and that was, and to, that was unify to unify Germany. Germany. Prime Minister, Prime Minister Gladstone, Gladstone of England, England had stated, stated the Iron, the Iron Chancellor, Chancellor made, made Germany, Germany great, great, but German, but German small. small. So, so section two of this lecture is, and let me just apologize in advance for my pronunciation of Italian names, uh, Rior Risorgamento, Risorgamento, Risorgimento, or just the unification of Italy. How about we use that? So let's start with a little bit of background to Italian unification. Uh, the Italian peninsula, as you can see here, is vastly different in climate, in soil, in the economy, uh, with the eastern and western portions resembling the climate uh, and population of Oregon. The southern peninsula was agricultural uh, versus the more urban and commercialized uh, parts of the north, with the papal states in the center. The Italy had no natural resources, or a few natural resources. They had no coal and no iron with which to build an industrial revolution. Under the Re Roman Republic 2,500 years ago, uh, the entire peninsula was united. But once barbarian tribes had conquered, the Roman Empire became fragment, uh, fragmented and the Italian peninsula became divergent 
uh, in a series of various kingdoms and city-states which formed in the Middle Ages, each highly competitive. The Latin language had united to some degree, but there were still vast dialect uh, and differences between the North and the South. The idea for Italian unity was a product of the Napoleonic Wars. During those wars, Napoleon had created the puppet kingdom of Italy, and this had stimulated a movement for Italian unification on the part of intellectuals and the middle class. Another question that must be asked, just like we did with Germany, was which Italian state would be responsible for the unification efforts? In the 19th century, it really saw three major independent states in Italy. The Kingdom of the Two Sicilies in the southern peninsula, the Kingdom of Sardinia, that was the island of Sardinia in the mainland area of Piedmont, and third, the Papal States in the middle. Other such region, regions as Tuscany, Lombardy, and Venetia were controlled by the Austrians, and those were located in the northeast. The Italians were fortunate that in Rome there was the center of their peninsula both spiritually and geographically and had been for 2,500 years. In those northeastern provinces there were a series of revolts in the 1820s and 30s and then the big one in 1848 but they were all effectively suppressed by superior force of arms of the Austrians. But the first identifiable patriot to set the idea of unity into motion was Giuseppe Mazzini. Just rolls off the tongue there, doesn't it? Giuseppe Mazzini. So Mazzini wore only black from the time that he was 15. Uh, this was the national uh, or the uniform to show your support for Italian nationalism. He was the spiritual inspiration for Italian unification, and he was nicknamed the Soul of Italy. He had been exiled from Genoa for his membership in a secret and violent organization based in, uh, while he was based in Mont Marseille in France, he founded the Young Italy Movement. Members of, all, uh, members of the Young Italy Movement were all under 40 and whose influence extended throughout Europe. Mazzini became the leading prophet of the Re Risorgimento. That was the movement for Italian unification, that they wanted to restore the nation to the glory days of the Roman uh, Empire and the Renaissance. And he would send propaganda and literature into Italian ports and hidden cargoes of stones and grains. Um, he had an intense dedication and visionary ideas were to be fulfilled by another generation of Italian patriots, but to the 19th century Italians, Mazzini remained the man who sacrificed everything, who loved much, who pitied much, and who never hated. And sounds like a get-along guy there. Good job. Giuseppe Manzini. The Carbonari, or the Italian word for charcoal makers, was an informal network of revolutionary societies that were active in the early parts of uh, Italian unification. They have uh, also been credited to influencing other revolutionary groups in France and Greece and Spain and over in, in Brazil and Uruguay. So, so in, in the, the early, early popular, popular revolts, revolts in, in Italy, Italy that, that were, were put, put down, down in Austria, Austria um, Austria, Austria remained, remained vigilant, vigilant to, to try and, and put, put down, down any, any future disturbances. disturbances. One, of One of the few centers, centers of independence, independence still remained, uh, that, that was still, still remaining, was Sardinia, Sardinia uh, the uh, island, island, and of course, course the, its, its counterpart, counterpart Piedmont. Piedmont. Its, its young, young king, king, Victor Emmanuel, Emmanuel II, II, refused, refused to, withdraw to withdraw its liberal, liberal constitution, constitution that had been granted by his father. So it would be Sardinia that the, the Italian, Italian unification, unification movement, movement would find its base, base and, and its, its next, next leader. leader. That, that leader, leader was, was Count, Count Camilio Benso di Cavour, 
I'm, I'm thinking, thinking I'm saying, saying that, that with, with proper, proper gusto. gusto. This is under, under Cavour's, Cavour's leadership, leadership that the Italian, Italian peninsula would become, become the, nation the nation of Italy. Italy. So he's, so he's the, the architect, architect of, of Italian, Italian unification. unification. He's, he's like, like the he's, he's like, like Bismarck. Bismarck. Uh, uh, he, was he was a brilliant, brilliant statesman, statesman, and, and his, his title was chief minister, minister to, to the king, king of Piedmont. Piedmont. Cavour, Cavour was, was born, born into a noble, noble family, family and, and trained, trained for a military, military career. career. Uh, he, uh, he became, became a, liberal a liberal after, after traveling, traveling uh, throughout, throughout Switzerland, Switzerland and France, and, and even, even to Great, Great Britain. Britain. Uh, he, made he made his personal fortune in the sugar, sugar industry, industry uh, investing, investing in steamships, banks, banks, and railroads. Once, Once he was financially, financially secure, Cavour, Cavour entered, entered politics in 1847. Uh, he, was he was also, also the co-founder, co-founder of a newspaper, newspaper called Is Is Il Il Ria- Ria- ah, I'm, I'm having, having really, really big, big difficulties with, with Risorgimento, which urged Italian, Italian independence. independence. He became, he became the, the premier, premier of Piedmont, of Piedmont uh, in, in 1852, 1852, and he, and he would concentrate, concentrate his efforts from this, from this point, point on, on freeing, freeing Italy, Italy from, from the Austrian, Austrian Empire. Empire. He knew, he knew that, that Sardinia, Sardinia could not take, take on Austria, Austria by itself. itself. That they, that they would, would need, need allies. allies. To that, to that end, end, he joined, he joined Britain, Britain and France, France against, against the fight against, against Russia, Russia in the, in the Crimean, Crimean War. War. And this, this enabled, enabled him to speak, speak at the press, press conference, uh, the peace conference, conference after, after the war, war where, where he publicly, publicly announced the Italian, Italian desire, desire for unification. unification. He had he made, made his impression, impression on, on France and England, England and, and prepared, prepared the way for the cooperation with Napoleon III against Austria. In 1858, Cavour held a secret meeting with Napoleon III to begin planning for a war of liberation. In exchange for additional territory from Sardinia, France agreed to cooperate in ousting Austria. If Cavour could go to Austria into attacking Sardinia, France would come to Sardinia's defense. So in the 1859 war, after the conquest of Lombardy, Napoleon III withdrew, and fearing ultimate defeat, and afraid of antagonizing the Catholics in his own country by aiding the avowedly anti-clerical government. Sardinia was only able to make small gains, but aroused nationalist fervor in other northern, northern Italian states. So we can refer to this map, and we'll see the growth of Piedmont, Sardinia from its original state in 1859 and through its transformation, first the acquisition of Lombardy to the Kingdom of Italy and pushing Austria out of Venice, and then finally um, unification of the entire peninsula. I tell you, reading about history, sometimes you come across men like Giuseppe Garibaldi, who is described uh, as another a uh, member of a unification, unification movement led by a romantic freelance adventurer in southern Italy. He was son of a poor sailor, and he personified the romantic revolutionary nationalism of Massini and the revolutions of 1848. He had been converted to the New Italy movement and later wrote in his autobiography that Rome that I beheld with my eyes of youthful imagination was the Rome of the future, dominant, the dominant thought of my whole life. He had been sentenced to death for part in an uprising in Genoa. However, he escaped to South America where for 12 years he helped lead a guerrilla band in Uruguay's struggle for independence. When he returned to Italy to fight in the 1848 revolution, Uh, He was was nicknamed the Sword of Italy. Garibaldi led his famous regiment of a thousand red shirts to rescue fellow Italians from the oppression of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. So in 1860, he had captured the island of Sicily and then marched to Naples, where the people were already in revolt. He intended to convert the territory into an independent republic, but he was finally persuaded to surrender it to the king of Sardinia. With most of the Italian peninsula united under the single rule of the king of Sardinia, Victor Emmanuel II, he assumed the title of king of Italy in 1861. 
Venice was still in the hands of Austria, but they were forced to secede it to the Italians uh, in the Seven Weeks' War with Prussia. The only thing that remained was the annexation of Rome. The Eternal City resisted the conquest because of the protection afforded to the Pope by Napoleon III. But in 1870, the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War compelled Napoleon III to withdraw his troops. And shortly after that, Italian soldiers occupied Rome, and in July of 1871, it was made the capital of a united Italy. There were, there were continually, continually problems, problems with, with the papacy, the papacy. and it wasn't, and it wasn't until, until 1929, 1929 that a formal, formal agreement, agreement would be reached. reached. But until, but until then, then, most popes, popes shut, shut themselves up in the Vatican, Vatican and, refused and refused to have, to have anything, anything to do with this new Italian, Italian government. government. They'd, been They'd been granted, granted an independent, independent status, status within, within the Vatican, the Vatican uh, and the surrounding, and surrounding buildings, buildings, and along, and along with, with other concessions, other concessions under Victor, 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 Victor Emmanuel. Emmanuel. But the but bitterness, 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 bitterness was, was too great, great until, until about 60, 60 years, years had gone by. What you're seeing, seeing in the picture, picture is, the, is, a is a soldier from, from this time, time period, period called, called the Pontifical, Pontifical Zouave, Zouave, which is Zouave, 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 Zouave. Zouave. A, soldier a soldier who uh, fought, fought for, for the Catholic, Catholic Church, Church and, and the Pope. Pope. So, once Italy became independent and unified, they established a parliamentary government. Their parliament had, um, was bicameral uh, with, with two houses, the Senate, uh, which members were appointed for life by the king, and the Chamber of Deputies that were restricted, uh, elected by restrictive franchise. Um, there was also the cabinet of ministers who were appointed by the king but responsible to parliament. So over the course of the rest of the 19th century, there was a steady growing socialism that was gaining strength in the poverty-stricken South, especially in Sicily and then the industrialized North. But there had always been a vast uh, chasm between the wealthy few and the large masses of illiterate peasants. Um, when we get into the depressions of the late 1800s, uh, we're going to see a lot of these revolutions and um, lack of infrastructure cause a mass exodus from Italy to the United States. So after unification, and between 1890 and 1914, six million Italians would leave. All right, y'all, thanks for tuning in this time, and I'll see you guys in the next lecture.